Thanks for the introduction. Um, just waiting for the slides to come up. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I, I have a lot of material, so I'll just say that, yeah, thank you for the introduction. So uh, what I'm going to show you is methods that we've been developing in the Kunjaji lab to take deep learning models, which are traditionally these very powerful models that are just used as black box predictors, and make them interpretable so that you can use them to gain biological insight. So without further ado, um, traditionally, we think that there is a trade-off between the learning capacity of a model and its interpretability. So, for instance, logistic regression uh, has, is a fairly simple model, but it's very interpretable because all you have to do is look at the weight vector vectors. Uh, random forests are somewhere in between. The disadvantage of logistic regression and random forests being that you can't just give it raw DNA sequence and expect it to learn. You have to featureize the sequence in some way, such as with a, a PWM scan, and that comes with its own disadvantages. Uh, support vector machines are very powerful. They can learn from raw sequence, but then the caveat there is that when you introduce kernels, sometimes you compromise on interpretability because you don't get an explicit weight matrix anymore. And deep learning has traditionally been put in the extreme corner, uh, and the goal of the research in our lab is to push it somewhere in that direction. Um, so just a very simple overview of what deep learning is. Deep learning consists of multiple layers of artificial neurons. What's an artificial neuron? Well, by analogy to a biological neuron, it is something that takes a number of inputs, performs a simple computation, and produces an output. The key being that when you combine multiple neurons working together, you can actually start to describe very sophisticated patterns. Uh, so deep learning is traditionally used in uh, image classification. I mean, this is where it is by far the state of the art. Um, and so. I'll give you an example of what these neurons do for image. So the first layer of neurons may pick out very simple patterns, such as uh, edges or brightness. And the second layer may start to combine them. You know, maybe, maybe Trump's toupee will be a second layer feature. Uh, and then the third layer will start to combine these basic features to pick out maybe broader shapes, uh, such as shapes of faces. So uh, these are the models that we have adapted for genomics. Uh, and to give you an example of a problem that we use them for in genomics, uh, the positive set might be the binding of transcription factors. So uh, it's, the, it's reproducible transcription factor binding sites, uh, ChIP-seq binding sites. The negative set being accessible regions in the same cell type that don't overlap the positive set. And the input is DNA sequence, but represented as an image so that we can take advantage of these deep learning techniques from computer vision and, and apply them for these tasks. So to give you a very, very high level overview of what these models are kind of doing, um, the first layer of neurons in, in these models are essentially acting like motif detectors. So each color there is a separate motif detector. You can, you can think of it like a PWM scan, but it doesn't have the constraints of a PWM, which is what makes them more powerful. Uh, and the layer after that will combine the outputs of these motif detectors to maybe pick out complicated patterns like positional grammar. So by analogy, in, in vision, these layers might be picking out features like eyes and noses, uh, and here they're, they're picking out, say, grammars by combining simpler on the features in the previous layer. And then finally, you have your outputs, which can be the binding of certain transcription factors. Uh, and it doesn't have to be limited to one output. You, these uh, work very well in multitask settings, and the more tasks you have, the more uh, powerful your models will be. So how does the interpretation work? Well, again, on a very intuitive level, uh, what we do is we look at a particular neuron and we say, OK, which, which of the neurons in the previous layer are contributing the most to it? So maybe we find, OK, this is the neuron that's contributing the most. Then we recursively go down and say, all right, which neurons are contributing to that? And when we go down to the motif detector layer, this starts to look a little bit like PWM discovery, because you find out which motif detector is most important for a particular output task. And this can go all the way down to the input level uh, so that you can get per base um, contribution scores for a particular task. But uh, keep in mind that this is task specific. So if I repeated this for Nanog, I would get a different set of contribution scores. So a different neuron might be responsible. Uh, and another thing, thing to remember is that the scores can be negative. So if a particular base is a mismatch to the pattern that the motif detector is looking for, it will have a negative contribution. OK, so uh, a few more technical details. The method is called deep lift. Lift standing for linear importance feature tracker, but I prefer to think of it as lifting the top of the black box. Um, it provides a predictive importance score for individual bases or individual neurons within the network. Uh, it works by assigning a linear breakdown of the contribution of each input to its immediate outputs. And in the case of uh, the networks that are popular in, in many of these tasks, this 
uh, reduces to a tailored approximation of the contribution, but uh, most sophisticated methods are used if, if in the case of other kinds of networks. Um, and uh, the key aspect is that these scores can be computed very efficiently. So uh, another method that's used to compute importances is in silico mutagenesis, and how that works is that you create a perturbation at each base, and you run the prediction on the perturb sequence, and you see how the output changes. This doesn't scale well, because if you have uh, you know, a sequence of then 1,000, and then at each base you have perturbations, and you have to propagate for every single perturbation. Uh, the method that we have, it, it just takes a single forward and backward pass, so it's much more efficient than in silico mutagenesis. And there are certain conditions in which it might actually give you closer to the result that you want. I don't have time to go into detail about that, uh, but you should ask me a question about it. Um, all right. So to motivate this with a biological example, uh, let's assume that you're a biologist and you're studying chip seek on Nanog. Um, what, are, what are some of the questions that you might have after you get the results of your ChIP-seq experiment? Well, you might want to do motif discovery. What are the primary motifs that are present? You may wonder about heterogeneity in your sequences, uh, sequence grammars, homotypic or heterotypic binding, and so forth. So the model that we trained was on the reproducible ChIP-seq peaks uh, for Nanog from ENCODE in H1 embryonic stem cells. And the negative set, it was a much larger negative set, so there was substantial class imbalance. It was the accessible regions that did not overlap the chip seek peaks in the same cell type. Uh, and we got fairly good performance. So the uh, traditional thing that a biologist might do is simple, uh, simply scanning the sequences with a PWM. And what are these PWMs that we are proposing to improve upon? Well, pictured on the left are the, uh, the ENCODE PWMs, which were derived from the same data. And you can see right away that there is an issue. Oh, I do not, ah, yes. Mm. Yeah, there is a, all right, never mind. There is an issue with redundancy. So you can see the TGCAT is repeated multiple times across different motifs. Um, if you look at, uh, so this is from uh, DeepBind, which is a deep learning model that's published that was predicting um, TF binding again from sequence, and if you look at the individual motif detectors, you again see this issue of redundancy cropping up, because you can see the CAAA appears in, in multiple detectors. But this is actually very intrinsic to deep learning models, because what's going on is that multiple different motif detectors are working together to uh, together describe a pattern in the underlying sequence. But what we would really like is to get a holistic view of what all the neurons are doing when, we work together, when they work together. Uh, and I'll show you a method that we have of, of actually extracting that. Um, but first, just you know, on a simple level, doing something similar to what DeepBind did, if we use DeepLift scores to rank all of our motif detectors, we will get some highly ranked motif detectors. These are detectors where if they fire, it indicates that Nanog is present. Uh, and we'll also get some negatively ranked motif detectors where if they fire, it means that Nanog is not likely to be present. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, you see this issue of redundancy. But I, I propose that we can actually get around this issue of redundancy. So how does that work? Well, the key insight is that filter contributions resolve at the nucleotide level. All of these neurons in the network are working together to describe a pattern at the nucleotide level. So we can actually start with the deep lift scores at the nucleotide level, which give a view of what everything in the net worked together to describe. And we can chunk these into regions that have high contributions. We can then replace these with the gradients. And what the gradients will do is they'll tell us not just what the net saw, but what it was hoping to see. So the gradients act as a kind of autocomplete. And then we take these segments and we cluster them uh, in, via cross-correlation co and then aggregate them. And once we aggregate them, we end up with much cleaner patterns. So what are some of the patterns we find? Well, we find the canonical Oxox nanog motif. Uh, we find Nanog, we find SOX2, and we find something that is annotated in Homer as unknown embryonic stem cell element, but if you look at Jaspar, it's a match to ZIK3, which is consistent with the fact that ZIK3 is implicated in the Nanog pluripotency network. Now, one thing I quickly want to point out, uh, I do wish I had a pointer. Um, that's okay. Um, well, you'll see it clear, clear in, in subsequent slides, but if you look at the unknown embryonic stem cell that is the, the fourth motif, um, you might see to the right that there's a hint of uh, picking out a nanog filter, uh, like, uh, picking out a co-binding relationship, which is completely missed by the PWM because the PWM simply does not extend to widths like that. Um, but moving on, because I'll show you that more cleanly in subsequent slides. Um, as a biologist, you may be curious about if, is there heterogeneity in our sequences? 
Well, um, if you take these very clean motifs and you use them to scan the sequences, you actually do uncover some heterogeneity. And in fact, the, uh, the second cluster from the top appears to be a cluster where you have enrichment of ZIC3 and Nanog, but not so much Oxox Nanog. Um, so maybe we can look at that cluster further to see if we can find some examples of heterotypic binding. Um, so what we do is we take what were originally the, the ZIC3 motif and the Nanog motif, and if we subcluster it further, um, you indeed find a, a new cluster which seems to suggest a combined ZIC3 Nanog um, combined ZIC3 nano grammar. Uh, and if we split that into two pieces, just, just for additional confirmation to make sure it's not a clustering artifact, uh, and we, we take those two pieces of what look like the combined grammar and scan the sequences for hits. And so here I'm scanning against the gradients that the model put on the sequence. Uh, I do find that there seem to be a subset of regions which have this very tight association between the nano motif and the, uh, the ZIC3 motif. Uh, and just as uh, a cherry on the top, I guess, there is a protein-protein interaction predicted between Nanog and ZIC3. However, we have not biologically validated, so this does have an asterisk on it. All right, and you know, similarly, you can dissect homotypic binding. So this shows examples of multiple hits of the Oxox Nanog motif um, in, that was in one, enriched in one of the other clusters. All right, so I'd like to move on to what we consider uh, the most exciting application of this, and that is to dissect context-specific reuse of, of regulatory motifs. So this is work done by Peyton Greenside in collaboration with Will Greenleaf, Howard Chang, and Ravi, Ravi Mihety. Um, and she is, Peyton is predicting accessibility across the hematopoietic lineage from sequence. So her input is raw DNA sequence, and her output is um, which cell types is it accessible in. And the example I'm gonna show you involves uh, hematopoietic stem cells, HSCs, B cells, and erythroid. So uh, here's an example region which is active in HSCs uh, and erythroid cells, but not in B cells. And if you just take this region and scan for canonical motifs, you see an SBI1 hit, you see a GATA hit, um, but you don't get a sense of which cell types those hits are important in. Now, if you look at the deep lift scores in HSCs, you suddenly see the, the uh, deep lift scores on top of the SPI1 motif jumping up, which is consistent with the regulatory role of, of SPI1 in uh, HSCs. If you now shift to B cells, so this is a region which is active in HSCs, active in erythroid, and inactive in B cells, you actually see low deep lift scores across the board, um, which is very interesting because when Peyton looks at regions which are accessible in B cells, um, SPI1 is an important regulator of B cells. In such situations, she does see the SPI1 motif have high deep lift scores. This is a region which is inaccessible in B cells, and the SPI1 motif is not getting high deep lift scores, which is what you want. Um, when we now shift to erythroid cells where this region is active, uh, suddenly we see the GATA motifs jump up, which is again consistent with the known role of GATA in erythroids. Um, and the SPI1 motif also gets high deep lift scores, which is consistent with the SPI1 chip seek peak at that location. All right, so you can do this for all the cell types across multiple transcription factors. Uh, Peyton has been flooding us with images like this. We're very excited. Um, so just to summarize, this is a new method for scoring the importance of features in, in deep neural networks, and it can start with raw, raw regulatory sequence, perform motif discovery, highlight key nucleotides, deconvolve heterogeneity, find grammars. Um, another interesting thing to mention is that this can be used to gain higher precision, so your chip seek peaks are, are fairly broad, but if you want to know precisely where the binding might be occurring, you get very precise deep lift scores at the nucleotides that are important, and you can use this to boost your precision. Uh, and also this, this tells you, gives you context specific scores so you can figure out which motifs are important for what. And although I didn't get to show it to you, this generalizes to other types of inputs. So we, we have done this to, to find say DNA and MNAs motif, just like you conventionally find sequence motifs. And uh, you'll be seeing that in a paper that our lab is, is going to publish shortly. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, my lab mates, uh, pictured at the top are the wonderful alpha testers of, of DeepLift and uh, my advisor Anshul. And uh, I guess I'll take questions. Okay. Uh, why is that, do you have a neural lab here? Do we have, yeah, we do. So where do we have the neural lab? Like, uh, like, uh, okay. 
um, it's going to be you know, less affine to the sequence. But when you have a ReLU, the affinity could be zero. Yes. Um, and I think like, this should be conveyed to uh, you know, the biologist or to the end user. So, because like, affinity logos, they have like, a different um, meaning in, uh, you know, when you are using PWMs or PSA models. The second one is that, um, have you checked for trivial differences between your background and foreground sequences? Like, for example, have you CG matched the negative sequences with positives? So uh, we have, our background set is accessible regions in the same cell type. So um, I, I suppose there might be slight CG differences, but practically speaking, that is actually the negative set that biologists are most interested in. I agree, right? but like you are using a deep learning model, and deep learning models are very capable at locking on trivial features and boosting AUCs and AUPRCs very significantly. Um, I remember like we trained a model, and AUC of the TF was like 0.97%, and the model was just counting Cs. You just count Cs in the foregrounds and compared to the background, and you have a better AUC and, uh, compared to the model. Uh, okay. Um, so, but also, I believe deep use dinucleotide shuffle sequences yeah. at the background. Okay, so um, we felt that the uh, we we preferred to use the accessible regions as the background. Um, I did not explicitly profile if there was a CG difference between um, the positive set and the negative set here. However, in models where there is a stark CG difference, I often see CG filters rise to the top. And here, when I visualized indi individual filters, I never saw CG filters. So I. Based on that, I, 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 well, even if there is a CG bias, the net is, that doesn't seem to be what the net is focusing on. Oh, are we, are we done? Okay, sorry. sorry. 